Hello, Curbsiders, and welcome to a special holiday episode of the Curbsiders. And we decided that for this special episode, we would talk about the gift that keeps on giving all year long herpes for everyone with infectious diseases expert, Dr. Robert Bedeker, MD. He is a professor of medicine at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University. This episode was a lot of fun to record. So without further ado, on to the show. Entertainment, education, and information purposes only. And the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For more, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity. Aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any, in fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible to screw up. We should always do your own homework and let's know when we're ready. Welcome back to the Curbsiders. Well, hello, Matt. How are you doing? Good. Stuart, the, the the audience probably won't miss a beat, but you haven't been here for a while. No. Uh, good to have you back. Yeah, about, a, what, like two or three weeks? Yeah, something like that. Paul, yeah. Paul has been just in his glory. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to listen. He's just been, yeah, he's been killing it with the puns in your absence. Um, Paul, would you mind telling the audience uh, what we do on this show? Sure. Be happy to, Matt. We are an internal medicine podcast that uses expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. We also do a little bit of uh, just getting to know the guest up front. So feel free to skip past that part if you want to get to the good stuff. Um, But you're missing out on quality conversation sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, Rob. So the first thing we always do on the show here, and we'll start recording now, is is ask you the, the, the some really important questions that everyone in the audience loves. So the first one of those is, can you give the audience a one-liner that kind of describes yourself and gives the audience a flavor of who you are, and it, not just as a physician, maybe some hobbies or interests you have outside of genital herpes, which is the talk, uh, the topic tonight. All right, so I'm a dad. I have a wonderful 12-year-old son born in Vietnam. Uh, I'm a happy husband. I love to travel, and I mostly travel on my stomach. I pick places for the cuisine to travel to. Travel on your stomach. (laughs) Must be difficult. (laughs) It's very slow, um, but you get to sample lots of things. (laughs) Bottom feeder. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. It's I like when we open the show by you insulting our guests and calling them a bottom feeder. <laughs> uh, I will try not to go any lower than that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rob, I actually, we know each other in real life, So, and I often see you kind of walking around with headphones on, so my question is very easy. What exactly are you listening to? <laughs> not you. You know, I I think that I'm almost ashamed to say that I actually am listening to nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these are noise canceling. These are noise canceling headphones, and uh, I just like uh, the the quiet. So usually yeah. I listen to nothing. That's the same thing I do. I'm so glad I asked. <laughs> and they're wonderful. They they are specifically tuned to your spouse's voice. <laughs> so like that is completely blacked out. What is your most favorable or most favorable what what is your most memorable um uh teaching moment most memorable teaching moment uh i'm going to say that um you might want to include me I... or paul in this uh just you know since since you were our teacher at some point and and are still mm. serving as our teacher but no pressure <laughs> no no pressure well you know, you, you, Matt, struck me as somebody very straight-laced, which, uh, and I, I'm not, so I, I kind of, like, uh, shied away a little from you, and, and Paul, <laughs> I, I think, is, in, is incorruptible uh, by, by me. Um, I, I will say that one of the big things that I'm trying to do is uh, look at anxiety among med students, and... Mm. Uh, reducing stress among them because, you know, miserable med students are going to make miserable doctors. And uh, one of the best lessons I learned actually was from my son. So I was uh, on service at the cancer hospital and 
it, it can be quite draining to be, you know, trying to help people who are just so sick. And I came home one day um, and my son was very uh, almost afraid. He said, Daddy, are you are you mad at me? And I said, hmm. no, no, I'm not. Why? He said, well, you seem so upset. And I said, well, I, I hmm. saw a lot of really sick people today and, and it made me sad. And he said to me, well, you should be happy because you made them feel better. That's good advice. And so I, there's so much in there uh, that, uh, right, that, you know, even if I get exhausted, I'm still helping people, but also that I'm bringing it home. And my son picked up on that. And mm. we have to process through our own emotions. Otherwise, they're going to show up in different yeah. ways. How, how old was he at the time? He was about 10, actually. I, I feel that kids kids and medical students and interns, they still have that kind of like beginner's mind where they're just so excited anytime they help anybody. And then you very quickly become kind of jaded on that sort of thing. And yeah. so it's it's pr- it's probably good to keep them around. That's that's one of the main things that I like about <laughs> medical education. Paul, what what do your kids do when you when you come home and you've had a bad day? They are aggressively apathetic. <laughs> They're my mediocre sons do not care. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, I wanted to ask you I wanted to ask you a question we've been asking recently is about failure or or just anything you've struggled with at any point in in life or in your career and what you learned from that. So the I think one of the biggest failures, and I, I, I will still say I, I feel a little traumatized by it. Um, uh, there was, uh, um, I listened to somebody that I feel, and it still is sort of a, 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 a superior doctor, a smarter doctor, uh, who's not in my field. And that doctor had a really strong opinion about what to do. And I ended up deferring to that doctor. And it really, I felt like this is not right, but I'm going to listen to the senior doctor. And uh, and it actually turned out to have a horrible outcome because I didn't listen to my gut, actually. And I deferred to, I guess, uh, the senior doctor. And so now I, I, I listen to my gut and... Uh, um, and I'll listen to the senior doctor, but then I'm going to do what I think is well, what I think needs to be done. I guess that sounds rather vague, doesn't it? But uh, it's yeah, very vague. I mean, we, we want to keep it HIPAA compliant. I'm not sure if you can right. get if you if you don't want to get more details, that's fine. But I, I think the the teaching point is is clear from what from what you're talking yeah. about, right? Yeah. Well, this uh, yeah this the outcome, like I said, was 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 pretty bad. And, uh, you know, somebody said, well, look, the person's getting better. So let's just send them home. They've been in the hospital a while. And I said, but they're immune suppressed and we don't know what this is and they shouldn't have gotten better. Um, and uh, but, he, but I deferred to that and we sent the patient home and it got worse immediately and uh, came came back uh, pretty sick. Um, so that's sort of what happened. Well, that's that's a great I think that's a great thing to point out and uh one of the things about I guess I mean even just in leadership in general uh running rounds I think about that a lot where I try to get the students uh, the students and the residents to just say their ideas like no matter how silly they think they are cuz even if they're if they're wrong you know I I would still at least consider what they're saying and also it might maybe it'll set somebody off on a different line of related thinking um it's that's kind of a an adjacent sto- adjacent thing to what you're talking about, but basically where not necessarily the smartest quote smartest person on the team is going to have <laughs> the best idea or know what's yeah. right. I guess I could give a I could give a counter example where I was the expert and I started giving orders. So the the my fellows were saying, "Oh, this person has hantavirus. She <laughs> must have hantavirus," and I said. <laughs> She does not have hantavirus. She, but she was in New Mexico. And I said, she was in New Mexico three months ago. She does not have hantavirus. But it could be hantavirus. And so I said, I forbid you from talking about hantavirus. <laughs> and so that, sh- that finally shut them up. But then they ordered the hantavirus IgM. Okay. 
And then they came back to me because you know what the IgM was? It was positive. So they said to me, look, the IgM is positive for hantavirus. It's hantavirus. I said, it is not hantavirus. I told you no more hantavirus. Um, you know, the patient was really sick, fevers to 104, whole body aches. Um, I knew that it was something weird. And, uh, but the problem of, of, uh, the problem of a diagnosis of saying it's hantavirus is then you don't say that it's something else. Right. You don't you close your mind off to that. Uh, and um, so we delayed uh, her diagnosis and her therapy. Um, well, I guess we were part of the team that was figuring this whole thing out. Um, so that was also uh, a lesson that I learned to uh, be a little more aggressive and looking for things outside of infectious disease. All right. I think I think we should move on to the main topic here. Which is, uh, what do you call your lecture, Rob? Uh, again, what, what's this famous lecture you give on this topic? So this is herpes for everyone. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, I guess it's kind of a true title. Uh, why, why do you call <laughs> it that again? <laughs> so, um, you know, herpes is this taboo topic. And like, you know, it's always spoken about and it's almost whispers, right? And uh you know, for herpes one, you know, up to like 90% of the world's population has herpes one. And, uh, you know, doctors are bad about talking about sex. And I want doctors to feel a little more comfortable talking about sex. And herpes is a great segue into talking about sex. All right. Well, we're going to try it. It's, it's not exactly <laughs> okay. our specialty on this show, talking about sex, right? Uh, but we'll we'll try it out. Ed, okay. Paul, Ed Paul, it looks like Stuart is uh, Stuart is Stuart is absent, so we'll use this as a uh, <laughs> we'll use this opportunity to go on without him. Oh, sweet merciful Lord! <laughs> Thank you for this gift that you've given us. <laughs> the the wonderful Kate Grant, who uh, f I guess for technical difficulties is not joining us tonight, but she helped to write and produce this episode, and uh, I imagine do some wonderful artwork, which will which is forthcoming for this. Um, she wrote, she wrote some cases here. So the first case, let's say we have, uh, you're seeing a 42 year old male. He's been married for 15 years. Uh, in his life, he's had eight female partners, one other one during marriage. I guess his faithfulness was not super strong. Um, he does not use condoms, has always relied on his partners taking the pill. And uh, he th he says, he tells you he's had a urinary tract infection about five times. He's never had any documented sexually transmitted infections he's been tested before and it seems like the urine cultures kind of always didn't they never grew anything but they seem to his urinary tract infections seem to go away with antibiotics and now he's coming in with some dysuria so anything about this story suspicious for herpes to you <laughs> <laughs> so uh this in and of itself no um you know, uh, I would go more towards some chronic pelvic pain type syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I would look for somatization or, or guilt, I guess you could say, um, <laughs> uh, for this. Because, um, you know, usually if you're going to be symptomatic with herpes, you're going to see an ulcer uh, on your penis or on your vulva. Let's say we did a very thorough physical exam. We actually did see a small s sore uh, near the urethral meatus. And uh, what are we going to do from here to to treat this guy to diagnose him? So for diagnosis, um, you know, if there's a small ulceration there, you know, you think, uh, so herpes would be a big one there. You would think about syphilis. Um, you know, if this is a recurrent thing, if it goes away completely, that's that's fine. If it gets continuous there, then you worry about penile cancer. But for diagnosis, um, I probably would swab it and send it for culture um, or for PCR now to, to clinch the diagnosis of that. And, um, you know, you could send serologies, but, you know, the lesion's right there. Let's, let's go for the, let's go for that and make the diagnosis. So, you know, uh, if it comes back herpes, um, you know, that's, it, that's sort of easy to treat. Um, you would, um, just give him some valacyclovir, um, and, uh, that should then clear it up, uh, more quickly. I think that the antibiotics that he got in the past did nothing. 
and it's just with time that it needed for the lesion to go away on its own. I do want to get a little bit like into the the nitty gritty of the testing and and what's available. Blood tests. Um, you mentioned culture and swabbing. Can you can you oh, walk biopsy. us through that a little bit? Bi- biopsy of the urethral meatus, Stuart. <laughs> yes. I, I I as a male, I can't go there. <laughs> um, I just can't. Uh, I'm an infectious disease doctor. I don't actually do anything. Right. That's right. I don't do anything. <laughs> You walk around and you don't even listen to anything. You just walk around with those noise canceling headphones. Yeah, those noise canceling headphones on, and I hear I, I tune out Paul also very well with these things. So um, you and everybody else, right? <laughs> What'd you say? Right. So you know, at, at first there was uh, culture, and herpes tends to grow very well in cell culture, but you have to have a lab that that can grow these things, and it should grow within about forty eight hours or so. Um, and then you'll get your diagnosis that way. Um, the problem with the culture is, you know, it's, it's super, super specific, um, but maybe not so sensitive. And if he shows up a few days into recurrent, uh, uh, ulcer, then the culture could be, could be negative. So now actually we're getting much, much better with PCR and you can send uh, a swab for PCR, uh, for this. And the sensitivity is, is really phenomenal. And that should be positive uh, as long as we're not towards the end of his, uh, of his lesion. Clinically, we, we say like any of these kind of like blistering lesions, once they've sort of like, once the fluid's gone and they've crusted over, they're less contagious. So it, it sort of makes intuitive sense that if you're trying to culture it, once it's crusted over, you, you wouldn't, you, the sensitivity would go down. Is that sort of what you're getting at? Yeah. So, you know, what the best thing to do is to have like that little tiny vesicle and maybe take a little tiny scalpel and sort of unroof it. Now, there's no uh, nerves sort of at the top of that vesicle, so that doesn't hurt. But what does hurt is then you want to get those cells at the bottom of the ulcer and send that for culture, send that for PCR. So not quite a biopsy, but it's but it ranks up there in sort of uncomfortableness uh, to be doing this right on the genitals. Mm -hmm. Right. And so once it crusts over, then pretty much everything is gone. So we have the culture, we have the PCR. Anything else that, from the actual lesion that you would that you would send? Um, I don't think so. I mean, this is not GC. This is not chlamydia, um, syphilis. You know, if you're a, a doctor from the 1800s, you could probably take a smear and look at it under dark field microscopy <laughs> for the spirochetes. And uh, I, I've never, I've seen a dark field microscope, but that's that's about it. Um, <laughs> I don't think there's much more to do uh, with the ulcer itself at that point. And then you mentioned the serology uh, for for a person with active lesions. How helpful is it to send the blood test for herpes? So um, you have to be careful in interpreting it. If it's you know if this is recurrent, so you're not going to get IgMs positive. Those will be negative. It's uh, the IgG will be positive, um, but then you have to say, well, it means that he has an infection now or in the past. You you can't necessarily attribute it to that, but it's very, very strongly supportive evidence that he's got uh, a herpes infection that's breaking out there. I think the perhaps the hardest thing now is, uh, so what to tell um, his wife, right? Right. Right. So one of the things that I like about infectious diseases is the more you study the pathogen, the more you learn about the humans, right? <laughs> so when studying herpes, you learn a lot about the humans. So, you know, herpes comes from the Greek meaning uh, to creep, which is sort of how people get this virus, I think. So um, when you go and you need to sort of counsel him about uh, what to do. You know, he has a steady female partner, his, his wife, and, uh, you know, what, what to say to her. If she does not have herpes, um, then uh, they say that couples have about a 12% chance per year of transmitting herpes from one person to the other. Now, they've been together for... Uh, 15 years, it says, right? So yeah. 
You know, the problem is that uh, uh, when did he actually um, start to get these things? Because he had one case of infidelity here. But, it, but in any case, uh, right, we, we sort of want to sort of counsel him about this. So um, there's this prodrome syndrome, and uh, it's an itch or a tingle. And since it's the nerves, the infections in the nerves, sometimes they can't describe uh, what the, what this is, what it is exactly, but they know that they're going to get an outbreak. And so what you tell people is, okay, no sex while you have that prodrome syndrome. And certainly, you know, no sex while you have, you know, uh, an ulcer. Now, I, I don't know too many people who feel very sexy with a painful ulcer on their genitals. Um, but you know, you said not, you said you don't know too many. So that, that implies that you do know some, I've, I've, I've spoken to lots of people in the world. I will say that. I'm sure nobody present here, I, I, would, have, I would have spoken to this about in any case, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, you want to decrease that. So no sex while you have an ulcer, no sex while you have the, the prodrome syndrome. And you, you do want to sort of diffuse the blame uh, or to decrease that or, or to see. Now, he could have gotten this before he got married and just has, you know, recurrences uh, that happen uh, every once in a while, even, you know, many, many years later. Um, so, you know, he could have brought this into the marriage. The other thing is um, you'll want to test her, you know, maybe she already has, uh, you know, herpes. And so, you know, they can just go at it, right? Without, uh, you know, any, any fear of transmitting the virus back and forth. And really try to say, I really focus on, you know, you could have had this for decades, you know, pick, picked it up, you know, as a teenager and all that stuff. Um, and what I actually really learned when you talk to couples about this is you learn about the trust and you learn more about the relationship and how willing they are to accept that. Oh, just so I'm understanding, Rob. So for for the wife who is uh, presumptively asymptomatic and you would recommend yes. testing, is this a, a point where serology, serologic testing would be warranted? This this would be the time where you would use it? Right. So I would check her for uh, herpes uh, antibodies, right? And if she's positive, then uh, you know there's no way that she's going to catch herpes from him, and then they don't have to worry. Uh, if they want to, um, uh, and if they're, if she's negative then don't have sex during those times. And also, um, it's interesting that since you don't feel sexy, right? When you have this ulcer, you don't have sex, you know, when you're highly contagious, you have this asymptomatic shedding, very low levels of the virus on the skin. And, um, so actually, even though it's very low levels of virus, um, that's when the virus gets transmitted, right? Because that's when people are having sex. That's when the skin-to-skin -skin contact happens. So you can actually take uh, valacyclovir chronically, and that'll vastly decrease the amount of viral shedding on the skin, in the vulva, on the penis, and decrease the risk of transmission from one person to the other. So you counsel this guy, you said, okay, if you, if you feel this prodrome, you shouldn't be having sex. Uh, certainly if you have lesions, you shouldn't be having sex. And you were going to, if his wife does not have HSV antibodies, then we're going to put him on valacyclovir for suppressive therapy. Would you also recommend that he uses like a barrier contraception method or is, is the valacyclovir by itself good enough? So uh, sort of a belt and suspenders type question? Yeah, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, so the valley cyclovir uh, has been validated um, and uh, for decreasing uh, shedding and to, to protect uh, serodiscordant couples. The condom use, uh, I'm going to say it's probably about 50% effective um, because this is sort of a total skin type thing. Um, and so any exposure could, could potentially transmit the virus. In his case, since it's right on the urethral meatus, probably it would be pretty effective. I think that probably just the 
valacyclovir be sufficient? The other argument you could say is it's been 15 years and they she hasn't picked it up yet. There must be some factor that that this that this virus just isn't going to be transmitted in this couple. Our next case is a female student. She's age 22. She's just come back from a trip to Germany and walks into clinic who, well, sort of hobbles into clinic, supported by her mom. She just looks like she doesn't feel well. She has a little bit of the antalgic gait that's broad-based. She's actually not able to sit down comfortably. She's crying because she's so in so much discomfort. Um, she is sexually active with a male partner and has been for the past six months, and they are reportedly exclusive with each other. They had initially used uh, barrier protection and then stopped, uh, and she's currently using depo contraception to prevent pregnancy. Her partner has previous, has had previously had female partners and has not used condoms with them. Um, he denies any partner since uh, starting dating the patient who's coming to your clinic. She does not believe him, and one of her questions is, should I dump him? So we'll get a, a chance to address that. But examining her, you see widespread ulcers over her vulva. She has swelling. She has exudate. And she can't even tolerate a speculum examination. And you're unable to visualize the cervix. She has palpable lymph nodes um, bilaterally. She has a palpable lateral halfway to the umbilicus. And she's not been able to pass urine all day long. So initial gestalt, what what do you think is going on here? And what would your next steps be? So this is uh, primary infection with herpes 2. This is sort of a, a classic case of what happens, sort of widespread ulcers, very, very, very painful, um, you know, with regional lymphadenopathy. And, you know, you can actually be pretty sick with this. You can um, have a lot of systemic symptoms. You know, you're, you're talking, this poor lady uh, has, you know, urinary retention. And, uh, you know, the virus, as it goes up into the sacral nerves, can cause some damage there. And you can have bowel and bladder dysfunction uh, from a primary uh, herpes infection. Luckily, that'll go away, usually, uh, on its own. Um, unluckily, it can take uh, a couple of months for things to turn back to normal. So uh, I would give her pain meds. I would give her viscous lidocaine. Um, I would... Uh, catheterize her to get the urine out of her bladder and maybe leave the, leave the catheter in for a while until her bladder can, uh, can recover from it. And, uh, you know, then I think that, uh, you know, with a valet cyclovir to help to, you know, shrink uh, or shorten the duration of this infection, you know, and then she'll be, you know, okay. For, let's focus on the virus first, um, which I will say is kind of the less Less are the interesting things in this in this case. So the the risk of her recurring having another outbreak is actually pretty high, and a lot of people can have up to five, you know, maybe even twenty percent will have more than ten to fifteen outbreaks in that first year, Oof. which is pretty pretty awful, and um, and they can recur and recur and recur. Um, on average, you're gonna like uh, have one less outbreak per year until it slowly burns itself out, which, you know, if you start off with 15, um, you know, that's like 15 years before they, that burns right. out. Right. So, um, you know, we want to see, uh, you know, is she going to be one of the people that have recurrences? So um, what I would do is I would write her a script for Valet Cyclovir and say, if you start to get an outbreak, you know, take this right away. Um, and that will shorten and sometimes abort the outbreak uh, for the person. If somebody has them frequently, uh, you know, more than once a month, I would just put them on valacyclovir every every day uh, and go for a year and then maybe stop it and see how, how things are going. So that's that's sort of the the virus. Um, you know, the the other thing is is again, you know, talking about the relationship and learning about the humans. Um, I have learned so much about people's marriages through this virus. Um, some of it, you know, very good and some of it, some of it bad. And I, I feel like this is almost a case of somebody that I, that I saw, you know, the, the young woman and her mother were in the exam room, both of them carrying flamethrowers at me. <laughs> um, and I think they probably roasted the guy and uh, then they were coming in and they wanted me 
to prove uh, that, um, <laughs> you know, that this guy was cheating on her. And you just don't know. There's, there's nothing that you can tell. Um, because he could have had it years and years ago. And uh, he, a lot of people don't actually know. They don't break out with this horrible thing that she has right now. He's having sex with this asymptomatic shedding and she picks it up. Now, this is not exactly what they wanted to hear. And, uh, you know, I guess they had just torched this guy, uh, this poor guy. I don't know if he was cheating or not, but me telling them that you don't know that he cheated. They were then absolutely furious at me. And the heat that radiated off the two of them was, was enormous. <laughs> Um, I, I don't think that that relationship uh, lasted, uh, um, but uh, so that that was that was that. Unfortunately, you you can't use this as a marker as to, you know, is somebody uh, is somebody cheating or not because you don't know if they came into the relationship with it. So with the with the follow up, so you, you'll give a prescription for valacyclovir to give if there's the prodrome, you start to feel symptoms again. If the rate of sort of recurrent episodes is so high in the first year, and you're going to have so many, why not just go right out the gate, start with prophylaxis? Um, that's a perfectly viable, perfectly you know, uh, uh, great way to to do it. Just to sort of you know uh, get things uh, under control and and not do it. Um, the issue is you just don't know what she's going to, what's going to happen to her. And maybe she, this is it. And she's not going to have another one. Um, it's just that there's a huge range of responses that uh, the human body will have with this. Why don't we move on to the next case? And uh, Stuart, did you want to read that case three? So this is an asymptomatic male. He's 25 years old, and he's currently coming for routine screening. He reports a history of 50 male partners total, including about eight in the last three months. One of these says that he had herpes, and the patient wants to see if he has it. So on examination, you find no ulcerations or warts, either urethral or anal. Blood tests are taken for both HIV and syphilis. Anal and urethral swabs are also taken for viral and bacterial infections. The first past urine sample is sent for chlamydia and gonorrhea. Dipstick urine does not indicate a urinary tract infection. Microscopy from both the urethral and anal swabs shows no pus, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, no white blood cells, and no intracellular gram-negative diplococci. He calls back a week later for results, and you say, all his tests are clear. He says, well, that's great, because one of the partners says he had herpes, so I am glad I am all clear. So what do you think about discussing both symptomatic and asymptomatic herpes with a patient like this? So, uh, well, he, he didn't have herpes before that uh, sexual encounter. Um, and uh, there's really no way to tell at the moment uh, whether he has herpes or not. So, you know, when we were, I remember, you know, in, in med school, um, you know, uh, what was it? we were talking about, you know, gay men's health and, and somebody raised their hand and said, I, one of my classmates, I, I heard, I heard gay men have like, like 50 sex partners or something like that. And all I could say to him was like, you sound really jealous. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, right. So we could talk about, you know, anybody who has, uh, you know, uh, lots of sex partners is going to increase the risk, but you know, it, it only, it only takes one. Right. So, right. So I'm glad that, you know, we, we should screen the person for, you know, STIs sort of right now. And uh, so, it's uh, so I think this one is a recent encounter, right? So, you know, it, it's probably not going to show up uh, that he uh, had it, uh, that he has it, or that he picked it up from from his partner. You need to wait, uh, you know, a few days for for gonorrhea, up to a week for herpes to show up. Uh, chlamydia can be about ten days or so. Um, so you want to do this baseline testing to know if he had it before this encounter. And uh, so you do all these swabs and um, that and don't find it. And, you know, it's not necessarily that he's in the clear. So he could have picked it up from this guy um, and he could have an asymptomatic infection. And so now he's sort of, you know, periodically asymptomatically shedding it. Um, he uh, could have had it before, right? And you're not going to uh, pick it up. So you can do blood testing in him. 
to see if he's ever been infected with uh, herpes. So that's not going to really necessarily tell you that he got infected just now. Well, I guess the IgMs uh, can can sort of help to sort out a recent infection versus a more distant one. Um, but here's one of the things about you know do you do you want to screen? So the U.S. Preventive Task Force. Um, and actually the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology both recommend against, against routine screening uh, for herpes. Because um, there are a lot of people with herpes, a lot of them don't know. Um, so you can say, well, why not find out? Let's find them and then we can put them on suppressive therapy and stop you know, herpes from spreading. Um, but the issue is that, you know, uh, it has to do with sort of the numbers of people that you're going to end up screening and the false positives and sort of the, what you're going to do. And then like, it's going to open up all of these relationship type issues and, uh, really sort of recommend, uh, against screening, uh, people for this just off the street. Now he's specifically asking for it. He's had an exposure and so he might be somebody that I would talk about the pros and cons of screening him uh, for for herpes. Um, so it sounds like I would talk to him about uh, PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is probably a different episode of, of Curbsiders, and safer sex. And, you know, I would uh, throw condoms all over him. And, uh, <laughs> and I would... Um, Say you know probably uh, you you probably dodged this bullet, but you know let's let's talk about some safer sex and how to have fun in a in a safe fashion. And we we have done a prep episode, so we are and and an HIV episode, which I don't it probably will have been released by this time. Uh, that this episode. oh okay. So we're, oh, so, uh, we're covering our we're covering our bases uh, in the in the uh, sexually transmitted infection world. Um, so this, good, good job. So thank you. This so with this one, it sounds like this was not exactly. I guess you wouldn't. Is, is it exactly screening if the patient, you know, has been exposed? But so you're saying that basically for for pa any patient that just comes in your office and says, "I want to be checked for herpes just to see if I've ever been exposed," and they don't have any symptoms or anything, it's not recommended. But if if it's part of your kind of STI panel, then maybe. Then maybe it's okay to 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 test for uh, antibodies, but it's not like it's not one of our routine tests, right? If someone comes in and they said they had unprotected sex, it's not one of the ones that's recommended to throw in there with your your HIV, your gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, things like that. If if somebody comes in and says I want to be checked for all my all the sexually transmitted diseases, um, I don't check for herpes. Okay, so I'll check syphilis, chlamydia, gonorrhea. Um, HIV, you know, Hep C and Hep B, um, but I'm going to leave the herpes simplex uh, alone. Um, you know, if they come and specifically ask about that, um, then I would sit down and sort of ask them. So, what is what does it mean? Why? What are you thinking of? Why? You know, what's going on that you that you would want this? Um, and if they say, well, I I don't know, I had you know a, a distant friend who that I didn't have sex with. Um, said that they had herpes or whatever. Uh, and I said, you know, probably you don't, don't need that. Okay. While we're discussing serologies, this, this might be a good time. Do you mind sort of talking about the difference between HSV1 and HSV2? Because I feel when you check, you sort of order both. So how, how should we conceptualize those? And which should we be worried about, one or both or neither? Presumably at least one of them, right? Uh, well... It's it's hard. I mean, I I get all these people in my office absolutely freaked out because you know somebody screened them for herpes and and you know HSV one or the you know the cold sore herpes came back positive and so their doctor told them that they had herpes and so now I have this crying person you know in my office. Um, so uh, right, so herpes one tends to cause the cold sores that people have. Um, herpes 2 tends to cause more genital ulcers. Um, if you get herpes 1, it still is herpes, but, but I actually just say, well, you have the cold sore virus, so I don't use that word herpes. You have the cold sore virus, 
you know, try not to kiss somebody when you feel the, the sore coming on. Um, the interesting thing is, so when you get infected with, say, herpes 1 and you develop immune, uh, antibodies to it, it'll protect you from getting infected with herpes 1 elsewhere in your body. And uh, it actually will be partially protective against herpes 2. So if you have, the, we'll call it the cold sore virus, and uh, you pick up herpes 2, um, you'll tend to have maybe a more mild case uh, than if you didn't have uh, the cold sore virus or herpes or herpes one. Um, so, you know, if somebody gets recurrent ulcers on their lip, uh, I would simply say they have the cold sore virus and I wouldn't send serologies. Um, I think that, you know, genital herpes is a lot of times a clinical diagnosis and you don't really need to send the serologies at that point. Um, the only time you would send serologies, I think, would be a case like this, there was exposure and uh, you want to make sure that he didn't have herpes before because then he's going to blame this guy for giving him herpes. And, um, you know, you get into all that quagmire, which we'll call human emotions. OK, I, I think this is a good time to ask the the other question that I'm sure I'm sure you've been asked before. So what if someone's having they have a the cold sore virus and then they're they're doing oral sex now, can they transmit that to someone's genitals and vice versa? If someone has genital lesions, can they transmit it to to oral lesions, basically? Right. Um, so the viruses, you know, herpes 1 or the cold sore virus is happier on the lips on your face. And <laughs> herpes 2 is happier uh, in your genitals, right? And so they'll cause more severe disease if they're in their proper homes. Mm -hmm. hmm. Um so, and they can cross over, and I, I don't know exactly how that would happen, but you can get herpes 1 in the general region. Perplexing. Yes, it is. You know, it's one of life's mysteries. So, and, and you can get herpes 2 sort of in the mouth. And if you get it in the mouth, you almost never get symptoms with that. It just sort of hangs out there and uh, it sulks for the rest of your life. <laughs> um, herpes, herpes 1... Uh, you know, can cause genital ulcers. And interestingly, uh, it's on the rise in the United States because um, herpes 1 or the cold sore virus, you aren't getting it as a kid as much anymore in the United States. And so you don't have that protective antibody. And then you pick up herpes 1 from having oral sex. And so that's uh, actually is an increasing uh, incidence of herpes one in the genitals. And, uh, right. And I see it's also the number one cause of, uh, genital ulcers, uh, in the United, United Kingdom now. So in the West, uh, Western countries, more developed, developed countries, uh, uh, herpes one is a big cause of genital ulcers. The nice thing is that it's not as severe. You don't get as many recurrences. Um, and it tends not to cause as many problems. I think that's cleared up. And I think I also served a good example. You were talking about physicians not being good at talking about this topic. I think I served a good example of that there. So I, I like I oh, like okay. hearing you put it back to us in like more uh less awkward terms than what I was I was using. So thank you. Right. So yeah, so you should be able to say all those anatomical parts to your <laughs> with your patients and you would be amazed at the times I'm pointing at things and giving them the names to the patients. Um Right. So this is the glands and this is the shaft. These are the, you know, labia majora and these are the labia minora. And, and they're paying attention because they don't know the names of these things. <laughs> sure. Uh, it's, I think it's our Puritan upbringing here in the United States, our, our Puritan it's roots. True. Right. Uh, we don't want to think about down there. Let's let's go on. Let's move on to our. We have a couple cases about uh, that deal with uh, herpes and pregnancy. So the next one right. is a 20 year old female. She is uh, 10 weeks gestation. This is her first episode of genital herpes. She's frantic. This is her first child as well, and she wants to know what's the risk to the fetus, and you know what would be the treatment for herpes during the the first trimester. Okay. So uh, I, I agree. I mean, this would be pretty scary, right? You know, your first episode and, and fear 
uh, for the baby. But the nice thing is you can really sort of put put mom's fears to rest that her immune system is going to contain this virus um, and uh, it's going to not let the virus go to the baby. That's a pretty, pretty rare occurrence. And so her immune system, if it's fine, it's going to handle this. She's going to be uncomfortable. You can give her uh, acyclovir. It's an incredibly uh, safe drug in pregnancy and sort of uh, clear, clear this up. So this initial event, I think, is, is pretty okay. Um, and it's uncomfortable for her, um, but she'll sort of help her through it. So for that, for this initial case, right, she'll get over it and she'll be fine. So then you have to say, okay, well, you know, pregnancy sort of goes on. And, um, you know, what, what do you do uh, when the baby's about to be born? So what do you, what do, you do then? I have no so, idea, so I hope you'll tell us. <laughs> okay. Well, you call OB. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> right. So um, you want your... OBs to know that she had a recent uh, case of herpes, and they need to do a really good uh, vaginal exam to make sure there are no active lesions. No active lesions in the vagina, on the labia majora, or anywhere uh, in the perineum, then you do uh, vaginal delivery. Any concern about an active lesion, uh, then you want to do a C-section on baby. Um, but if there's nothing there, even though she had a first case of few, a few months ago, um, uh, you can go ahead and, and do a vaginal delivery. If the baby has antibodies, is it just, I guess, the, the risk, the infection risk is just so much higher if there's active lesions with, with fluid there, with the virus, that, that even with the baby having antibodies, you still don't want to risk it? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, you know, the... Uh, if you have an ulcer, especially early on, um, you got to think of that as just a, as a virus factory, just pumping out huge amounts of virus. And that may overwhelm uh, the antibody's ability to, to contain it. I mean, if there's no lesion there, then she could have asymptomatic shedding. And the amount of virus is very, very, very tiny. Um, and so you can say that this is safe. Now, so everybody knows if there's a herpetic lesion in the vagina, then you do a C-section. So now the number one time when babies get neonatal herpes, which is a devastating uh, disease, it's, it's horrible. Um, so the number one time babies get it is when mom is asymptomatic, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Because if you got a lesion, you're going to do a C-section and the risk is pretty, pretty tiny. Um, so you have that very tiny risk of catching herpes from an asymptomatic mom. Because my question was, I mean, we know this 20-year-old from the example, she now has herpes. She could be asymptomatically shedding at any time. Why not keep her on acyclovir prophylaxis for like the whole pregnancy? And so actually that, that would be a very good idea. Just put her on the acyclovir. Um, the nice thing is, is it takes viral enzymes to activate it. So it, it's not active in any cell that's not infected. And so the, it really has no effects upon the, on the developing baby um, or pretty much any other cell. Um, and it has to be activated by, uh, by the herpes virus. So putting mom on this uh, uh, is a good idea and, and could decrease that risk even, even lower. And and I think uh, our 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 off air producer here, Kate, was was mentioning that in the UK guidelines, they recommend acyclovir from thirty weeks on in patients who have recurrent herpes. Kate, is that if yeah. they're having thirty six weeks on? Is that if they're having an active recurrence? Then you just start it from thirty six weeks and just continue it through pregnancy, or the the delivery rather. So I think it's probably uh, uh, a woman who ha who. Uh, tends to have recurrences, uh, I, I would probably put her on, on the acyclovir to prevent shedding and also then to prevent an active lesion during pregnancy, which would then necessitate a C-section right. with all the risks that that entail. Yeah. So the acyclovir could save a C-section. 
Hey, this is Matt, and I just wanted to cut in here and just quickly clarify the point that we're making here about suppressive therapy for women who have had have not had any active lesions from herpes during their pregnancy. They do not need suppressive therapy with acyclovir. But if a woman has active lesions either from a primary outbreak or from a recurrent outbreak of genital herpes during her pregnancy, then she should be put on suppressive therapy starting at 36 weeks, and that should be continued up until the time of delivery. And and I should also mention, we joked about it, but yes, you should consult OB if a person has active lesions at any time during the pregnancy and make sure they're aware of that. Okay, and now back to the show. Paul and Stuart, any questions that you wanted to ask Rob before we let him go or get any final take-home points from him? No, I think we hit all my burning questions. Mm. Mm. Is that a pun? <laughs> Good one, Paul. <laughs> yeah, just beating Stuart to the punch. <laughs> you know, we, 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 we talked a lot about genital herpes, but about cold sores, is there any efficacy for topical agents? There any efficacy for topical agents? Um, you know, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say yes. And uh, as long as you give it with pills. <laughs> um, I, I think <laughs> hmm. I think people really like uh, you know to put a salve on something you know and it gives them something to do um, <laughs> you know the the right yeah, I give patients a lot of busy work I think sometimes right it's sort of part of the placebo here um, and uh, so if you have this salve uh, uh, you know give them some do make sure that they wash their hands after each time that they they apply this. Um, it could also be that, you know, either the ointment um, could sort of keep the, you know, sort of form a protective barrier and make it less less painful, just the ointment part of it. And um, there is some active uh, uh, replication going on in the epithelial cells where the, the ulcer is, is happening. And so, you know, you're going to deliver some of the drug right to that spot. Um, but don't don't rely on that to to control the infection. Um, I would definitely prescribe pills. And you know, I, I'm going to be honest. I can't remember. You know, acyclovir comes in a cream and an ointment, and one of them really burns if you put it on your genitals. Um, and so you got to use the other one. And I can never remember which one's which. <laughs> you might want to check that before you prescribe it next time to the next patient. Well, I, I would. I would get some feedback, I think, um, <laughs> about that. So I, I, you know, if somebody's got a cold sore, I, I let them get a, put a acyclovir ointment to, for mostly the ointment portion of it and then give them valley acyclovir uh, to, uh, to help get it under control. I, I, I will tell you if I have time for a quick story. Sure I do. saved. I saved a marriage. It is the infectious disease wedding counselor to the rescue. <laughs> so I get a phone call, say, oh, my God. <laughs> the, uh, uh, you know, if my friend is getting married and the stress of the wedding, he's got the tingling on his lips. He's going to get an outbreak. And his bride said, if you have a cold sore on our wedding day, I will not kiss you. Oh. Mm. oh, right. So I get this panic phone call. What, what can we do? What can we do? And I said, okay, here's what you do. So you just blast them with, with valley cyclovir. So I give them a gram Q12, which is, you know, uh, that's, that's good for a prodrome syndrome to sort of, you know, it'll decrease the duration of it. And sometimes it will abort, uh, the outbreak. And so, uh, he, uh, I, told him to prescribe this. He took it. Um, I am very happy to say that uh, we stopped the outbreak and they kissed on their wedding day and they're still living happily ever after. You you did it. <laughs> I did it. I did it, right? So you can see again, like, you know, the virus is teaching us about sort of human behavior, right? I mean, she wasn't going to kiss him because of this, uh, of this infection. And that, I think that would set a bad tone. Um, uh, Kate, for the rest of their wedding. And right? Kate was bringing up, couldn't he have just used toothpaste? This is an old wives' tale that Kate Kate was mentioning she's heard about. Does does toothpaste toothpaste work for oral well, uh, the I, cold sore virus? <laughs> I, I think that the toothpaste is probably really good, and and uh, probably if he never used toothpaste, um, his bride might not want to kiss him as well. <laughs> um, you know, I, I I think that 
toothpaste again, it would be only just putting something there to sort of, you know, make it not so sore, so painful. Mm -hmm. Try to keep it moist until it heals up. Do you have any any other like favorite points about herpes that we didn't ask you about or any any just general take home points you wanted to give to the audience? Because I know it's way past your bedtime at this point. (laughs) (laughs) Right. It is. Um, I, I think that's it. And, you know, uh, you know, if you if you have herpes, uh, you know, you can sort of welcome it to the family. It's, it's not the end of your sex life. Um, there's no blame here. You're not dirty uh, for having uh, this virus. And there's things we can do and you're going to live a full and, and happy life. I think that I think if you have herpes, welcome it to the family is going to be like the teaser line for this episode. (laughs) Everyone will have to listen to figure out why you were saying that. Right. Thank you so much, Rob. This was awesome. Okay. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Get show notes at www.thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at www.thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your personal inbox. That's right. Your inbox, not mine. We are committed to providing you with high value, practice changing knowledge, and to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes, or contact us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. Or reach out on Facebook, Instagram, and on Twitter at The Curbsiders. Until next time. I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And I'm Dr. Stuart Kent Brigham. We'll leave this pause for in Kate Grant's memory, and Kate Grant's here. <laughs> and I remain Dr. Paul Nelson Williams, and good night. Good night, Paul. Good night to you. Thanks again, Kate, for helping to write and produce this episode. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> in memoriam. Kate's, Kate's typing Rest us, in peace, Kate. <laughs> yeah, Kate, Kate's typing us funny things on Skype here. And uh, thanks to all our curbsiders who helped to write and produce the show, including our social media team, Hannah Ab- R. Abrams on Twitter, Beth Garbs Garbatelli on Instagram, and Chris the Chew Man Chew on Facebook. Thank you and good night. Hey, Matt, you know what vegetable you shouldn't eat that your wife makes? I, I would prefer you don't talk about my wife, no. but what? <laughs> <laughs> what vegetable? Her peas. Her peas. I uh, <laughs> don't like any of that. So I don't know if that's a pun or more of just a play on words. Paul, ju- judges? <laughs> I, I don't know what that was. It was not good is what it was. <laughs> okay, well, all right, fine. It made me laugh, the- though. <laughs> It's one. Of, it's one. Of the, it's one of the most sexist diseases. They thought about calling it his peas, but that's just as bad. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to stop recording. Yes, please do.